I'm guessing most of you have like a favorite banner in fandoms or somewhat. Like even young adult books are even a fandom in themselves. So the book that I'm presenting today actually is <coughs> a very interesting take on fandoms themselves and their culture. Um, it's called Kill the Boy Band by Goldie Modaski. And Kill the Boy Band follows these four girls who are obsessed with this band called the Hoopers. They were discovered through a talent show and were somehow grouped together to, call, to um, create this superstar band. Sound familiar? <laughs> and um, these four girls figure out they're coming to New York to perform a concert and book a, ho book a room at the hotel that they're staying at and somehow kidnap one of the band members. <laughs> And so what makes this book just, just amazing is there's really three reasons. First is this book is a nostalgia bomb. When I was, in, back in 2012 when One Direction was like topping all the charts, I would have classmates all around me. I went to an all-girls school who had One Direction posters covering their lockers and just covering every inch of whatever they wanted to adorn themselves with. So that was always, you know, sort of jarring to me because I didn't really like One Direction. But something I still found interesting because of the culture, it is, it tackles nostalgia in this very Great Gatsby-esque way because it still, it emphasizes um, nostalgia first is really fun. The main character delights in seeing gifs of the Rupert's every day, this thing in Stan Wars with her friends online. But at the same time, as the book goes on, it's sort of the nostalgia story morphs into this very dangerous aspect that she realizes, wow, you know, this is not something I want to be a part of for the rest of my life. Um, the second reason is this book is um, a really great modern satire, which is basically a work that uses the use of humor, or irony, or exaggeration to expose um, humanity's vices or stupidity. Although even like although like fandoms and like fangirling obviously is not stupid, it was really interesting to see like this book sort of blow up all the fandom aspects that it's been um, that the world has been really seeing for the past couple of years and just really observing everything and taking the time to um, process this culture we live in where everything is based on obsession which transitions to my third point, which is that this book has a really, really strong message on identity. And so, one of my favorite bands, Fall Boy, they have this lyric and they say, you are what you love, not who loves you. And while obviously that's very, very true, in this book, Goldie Monaski shows that, yes, what we love surely shapes, surely shapes who we are, and definitely defines us, but it definitely should not engulf our entire personality. Like even when people look back and say, oh my gosh, in high school, I love this and th this and that. We recognize that because it shapes who we are, but it does not define who we are as a person. And in this, and in this book, the main character sort of um, um, uncovers her identity struggles when she realizes that she doesn't want to be identified with this band her whole life. And comes, to, and comes to issues with who she wants to be and who she's forming herself to be at that very moment. And so for me, it was sort of a, <coughs> sorry. For me, it was a sort of a, a lesson for me, especially since I'm going into college next year, that, um, <coughs> that you know, not to at this, not latch on to my past as much, but still embrace it in order to look forward towards my future. And so I definitely recommend reading this book because it's definitely funny. It's definitely really extreme, yet mature at the same time. And I think it would be a great book, despite its very harsh reality to take on things, to people everywhere who have been a fangirl, experienced, experienced this fangirl culture, or just simply want to know a little bit what it's like and see the extreme circumstances of uh, what might happen when all this sort of derails. And it's a very, and very nice cover, and I hope you like it.
have any questions in the audience who wants to know more about it? Yeah, I'm actually interested. Are the girls that are the main characters that kidnap the boy band member, is this because they're super fans or are they trying to ruin the concert? Um, they're, they're essentially just super fans. In the description it says, we didn't mean for any of this to happen. They sort of just accidentally stumble upon the situation and it's a coming of age moment for everyone and they don't know what to do. Okay. Is there a line in the book you're really fond of? Um, I think, yeah, it's like on page, um, yeah, it sort of resonated with me as like, you know, it's a reminder of like the sort of the joy of moments in the book and why, you know, um, Goldie, you know, wants to write this book in particular. It says, I love the Rupert's for who they were, sure, but I mostly love them for how they made me feel, which was happy. The Rupert's made me happy. The simplest thing to be in the world and the hardest. Anyone else? Well, I was going to say, who's your favorite character in it? Like, what character is there a specific character that just resonated with you in particular, or that you thought was really uh, multifaceted? I really like the main character. Um, she actually, spoiler, sorry, she actually remains unnamed, but she uses all these facades that she tries to build up on herself, and she's sort of finding her identity. And it sort of reminded me of when I was in high school, and when I was still trying to find my identity, and not trying to be lost in like, being attached to one person, but still making myself distinct. Do we have any other questions? Nothing? Um, okay. Well, thank you very much. Good job. Who is our number two? Emma. Emma will be reviewing The Blue Girl by Charles DeLint, correct? Yes. Very good. Tell me when you're ready. And go. So the book I will be promoting is The Blue Girl by Charles DeLint. It starts, as many books do, with the protagonist moving into a new town. And because she's new to this place, she's unaware that Newford is pretty much the center of all kinds of supernatural stuff and it's pretty uh, and it's pretty common for someone to be like oh yeah my girlfriend got absorbed into the internet where she's where she's the goddess of a website all she wants is a life out of trouble to just go through school with her head down as much as possible not because she's afraid but because she was a delinquent and she wants to turn over a new leaf. And in this way, she decides to make only one friend, try and get out of the high school drama nonsense. And she and Maxine, her polar opposite, hit it off very quickly. Unfortunately, no matter, even in high school, weird stuff does happen, which is how she meets the school ghost. And the school ghost wants her to believe that, yes, I'm a ghost, and there's other things here that you really need to check out. Please, why won't you believe me? You're so cute. Unfortunately, his good intentions go south very fast, and our protagonist and her friends must now find a way for her to not... Well, the problem is not so much she'll die as more like she doesn't want her soul devoured. So, so that is the main plot, but there's other veins running through it. Like Maxine, the best friend, has a very strict, cloistered life, and she's like, dang it, it won't kill me to like wear jeans to school. And so Imogene, our protagonist, helps her uh, trying to help her break out her shell and be less constrained and there's romance going on but fortunately boys are not the main thrust of it sure there are ma male characters but the it's the bonds between the two girls and their other friends are what's more important and it is this bond that will help her help the two of them go through survive the soul eating business 
Let's see. Other details. Not only is there a ghost in the school, there are several fairies who are friends with the ghost and they and the ghost, by the way, has very bad taste in friends, which is why he keeps hanging out with said fairies, who they're supposed to look after the school. Unfortunately, they find such things as food poisoning to be hilarious. And these are and these are the beings he really wants Imogene to meet. No accounting for taste. As for Imogene herself, she wants to turn over a new leaf, but on her own terms. It's like, yes, I will still dress like I just jumped like I just jumped out of a thrift store, because I do enjoy shopping at thrift stores. But I can but that doesn't mean I'm gonna go around punching people in the face. I, I simply want to stay out of trouble, maybe study for once, and, and make Maxine happy because really being a delinquent is no good if I make my best friend sad. Other details. You don't see it now, but the book cover is actually really cool looking. And as, as per the title, it's all in shades of blue. You see Maxine on one end of the cover um, with her tattoos showing and dressed like she just rolled out of bed, but stylishly. And on the other side, reaching out for her are blue shadows. Not so much shadows as like things that have ripped themselves free of the darkness and it's like, we want you. She does not look very thrilled about it, but nor is she terribly scared. It's like, ugh, I'm gonna deal with you later. Okay. Very good. Okay. Good girl. All right, so do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, up front. Oh, would you say that this book is more comedic or does it have its emotional moments? Definitely has its emotional moments. Um, and there's some lighthearted stuff because it wouldn't be a fun book if it was always so serious and always yanking at your heartstrings. But its its emotional moments are definitely earned, of course. Anyone else? Back corner. I was not a keep my head down kind of thing. I was more along the lines of, you will hear about how unhappy I am. Strong female protagonist. <laughs> yep, in the middle. Uh, if you had to choose one theme that encompasses this book, what would you say that was? Hmm. One theme. Bonds. Um, the good ones, the bad ones, the thing, the ones, the, that keep you from making the best decisions, all kinds. Any other? Any other questions? I have one. How is the pacing? Eh, let's see. I reread it recently. It's it was slower than I thought. It's not breakneck, but it's at a leisurely pace. But the world building's so good, it doesn't really matter. I'm. I have fun seeing the world of Newford, so I don't care that it takes a while for the for the main soul eating plot to kick in. All right, any last minute questions? Would you like to live in Newford? <laughs> I need to read more of the Newford books before I make that decision. There's some fun <laughs> stuff fair. and some terrifying stuff. <laughs> All right, any more? Okay, good job. Well done. That was The Blue Girl by Charles DeLint. All right, who's our third battler? Nada. Nada will be reviewing Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe.
The book that I'm presenting to you all today is Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe by Benjamin Alire Sainz. Um, this book is absolutely just the best book I've read in my entire life. So um, before I get into why I love it so much, I just wanted to read a small passage from it to introduce the characters. One thing was for sure. There was no way I was going to ask one of those idiots to help me out with my swimming. It was better to be alone and miserable. It was better to drown. So I kept to myself and just sort of floated along. Not that I was having fun. That's when I heard his voice, kind of squeaky. I can teach you how to swim. I moved over to the side of the pool and stood in the water, squinting into the sunlight. He sat down on the edge of the pool. I looked at him suspiciously. If a guy was offering to teach me how to swim, then for sure he didn't have a life. Two guys without a life? How much fun could that be? I had a rule that it was better to be bored by yourself than to be bored with someone else. I pretty much lived by that rule. Maybe that's why I didn't have any friends. He looked at me, waiting. And then he asked again, I can teach you how to swim if you want. I kind of liked his voice. He sounded like he had a cold, you know, like he was about to lose his voice. You talk funny, I said. Allergies, he said. What are you allergic to? The air, he said. That made me laugh. My name is Dante, he said. That made me laugh harder. Sorry, I said. It's okay. People laugh at my name. No, no, I said. See, it's just that my name is Aristotle. His eyes lit up. I mean, the guy was ready to listen to every word I said. Aristotle, I repeated. And then we both kind of went a little crazy laughing. So, like this part introduced, this book is not real person fan fiction about Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, and Dante, the Italian poet. Which was my initial suspicion when I picked it up off the shelf for the library. Um, instead, it's about 15-year-old Ari Mendoza and 15-year-old Dante Quintana, two Mexican-American teenage boys living in El Paso, Texas, in the summers of 1987 and 1988. When the book starts, Aristotle is this brooding, angsty, teenager-type character like we see in so many other teen novels. He reminds me a lot of Holden Caulfield, for example. He has trouble making connections with the people around him. He thinks that everyone else seems stupid, or Holden will call him funny, but... Um, and he has a lot of internal struggle, family struggles, and all of his issues with himself come with issues from things going on around him. And he meets Dante, and somehow they connect instantly over their names, over the summer they spend more and more time together. And Dante is like Aristotle's perfect opposite. He's sensitive, he's emotional, he's very caring, and he outwardly shows this happy side all the time. In a way, he sort of seems like a manic pixie dream girl at first, even though he's a guy. Um, but the author does such a good job of fleshing Dante out as well, and giving him his own struggles with his identity, his own problems making friends, his good trouble with his sexuality, and fear of disappointing his parents, things like that. Um, as the book progresses, the two of them are torn apart by circumstances. They spend the school year living in different cities, and then Dante comes back for the next summer, and they have to reevaluate their friendship and where they stand with each other. As I mentioned before, Dante's biggest struggle is his sexuality, and unfortunately for him, he's fallen in love with his best friend. And Aristotle is very resistant to this idea at first, but he doesn't want to ruin the relationship they have. Um, this book is a queer romance, but to me, I think more important than the romance, more important than the identity issues, is that this book is about soulmates. It's about two people whose friendship transcends what friendship is. This book isn't afraid to go into deep emotional issues, even though the narrator is a 15-year-old boy. Whereas many 15-year-old boy narrators are more focused on sex and drugs, and th those things do come up in this book, but emotions play such a huge part in building up this story. Both of these boys have great relationships with their parents, which is really uncommon for, y what, for young adult novels. Um, and their parents are their biggest support in their lives, and their parents are such pivotal characters to the plot. There's just so many details like that. The writing itself is so poetic. It's almost, it's prose, but it's almost like reading a poem 
The visuals are so striking and powerful. The emotions really tug at your heartstrings. All right. <laughs> Very good. Q and A time. Who has a question? Would you say there's a character that you identify with the most? In the past, it's always been Aristotle, and then I reread this book um, the past week um, to prepare for this competition, and I realized that I'm so much more like Dante than I ever realized before. Like having that's what I love about this book. You can read it multiple times, and every time there's like you discover something new about the characters that you missed the, the last time you read it. So definitely both boys in tandem, but now I'm leaning more to the Dante side. Any other questions? Does the book explain why they have such uncommon names? Uh, yeah, actually it does. Um, Dante blames his um, father, who's an English professor, and Aristotle was named after his grandfather. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I guess what was one of uh, your favorite moments in the book? Or... Um, can I just read another passage? Is that cool with you guys? Yes. Yeah. So at one part in the novel, Dante gets beat up after he's seen kissing another boy. And Aristotle goes to visit him in the hospital, and this is the conversation that Aristotle has with Dante's parents. Dante is my friend. I wanted to tell them that I never had a friend, not ever, not a real one, until Dante. I wanted to tell them that I never knew that people like Dante existed in the world. People who looked at the stars and knew the mysteries of water, and knew enough about birds to, to know that they belonged in the heavens, and weren't meant to be shot down from their graceful flights by mean and stupid boys. I wanted to tell them that my life, he had changed my life, and that I would never be the same, not ever, and that somehow it felt like Dante was the one who saved my life, and not the other way around. I wanted to tell them that he was the first human being, aside from my mother, who had ever made me want, about, want to talk about the things that scared me. I wanted to tell them so many things, and yet I didn't have the words, so I stupidly repeated myself. Dante is my friend. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. All right, who is our fourth battler? Okay. This is Megan with Perks of Being a Wallflower, correct? Yeah. All right. Yep. Okay. All right, so before I start, this is the cover of the book. This is the movie cover. The other book is um, the other cover is a similar shade of green, but with different faces of the main character, who I will get into right now. So the reason why I love this book is because this is the book that gets you through the dark days for whatever they may be. And as a little synopsis, the main character of Perks is a 14-year-old boy named Charlie moving through his freshman year of high school. The book is told through a series of letters addressed to dear friend. Who Charlie is writing to isn't mentioned. All that is said is, I'm writing to you because she said you listen and understand, and don't try to sleep with that person at that party even though you could have. What Charlie wants is to know that someone exists who will listen to him, and after reading this story, you will feel as if Charlie has listened to you in some shape or form. You learn fairly early that Charlie comes from a dark past, not so much from what is around him, like his family, but internally. He had to deal with losing his best friend to suicide, his aunt to a car accident he believes he caused. He has to deal with entering a new school, friendless, and gets bullied for liking to read and achieve good grades. He watches more than he participates in life. He's quiet and awkward and trying to discover not only who he is, but how the world operates. Those who bring him to life are his soon-to-be best friends, Patrick and Sam. But this isn't the book where everything goes smoothly after that, where Charlie, Charlie's friends fix him and they end on a happily ever after note like a lot of young adult books do. Charlie still moves through the darkness, still finds it hard to exist in the way that Patrick and Sam do in the world. I didn't mention too much about Patrick and Sam, but they're the extroverted friends that kind of just get along. They're also seniors, so Charlie has to deal with the age gap and the differences between being a freshman at a new school and having seniors who have already been through the school and made friends and have their own lives. Um, Charlie doesn't understand that loving someone is more than just loving the idea of them. When Charlie and his crush Sam finally discuss his feelings in death, she says to him, it's just that I don't want to be somebody's crush. If somebody likes me, I want them to like the real me, not what they think I am. I don't want them to carry it around inside. I want them to show me so I can feel it too. He also doesn't understand how complicated emotions in the mind can be. He writes in one letter, this is my life, and I want you to know that I'm both happy and sad, and I'm still trying to figure out how that can be. That's also one of my favorite quotes, by the way. As the book progresses, you get in-depth descriptions of Charlie's friends, their lives in relation to him, and his family. You learn that he is a wallflower trying to come out of his shell. 
We learn that everything he is dealing with is because of a pent-up repressed memory that exposes itself at the very end. I won't tell you what that is, that's what reading is for. What Perks makes you realize is that it is okay to have days where the world is far away, where you don't know yourself, where nothing makes sense. Um, I'm going to read this one quote from Charlie's diary that I feel like encompasses everything um, about him and about what he feels. It's much easier to not know things sometimes. Things change and friends leave and life doesn't stop for anybody. I wanted to laugh or maybe get mad or maybe shrug at how strange everybody was, especially me. I think the idea is that every person has to live for his or her own life, her own life and then make the choice to share it with other people. You can't just sit there and put everybody's lives ahead of yours and think that counts as love. You just can't, you have to do things. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to be who I really am and I'm going to figure out what that is. And we can, sit, we can all sit around and wonder and feel bad about each other and blame a lot of people for what they did or didn't do or what they didn't know. Perks could easily be overlooked as a simple novel, another teen in high school trying to find themselves, but Charlie cannot be ignored. There is a rawness to his character, a complicated lens needed to explore themes like depression, anger, sexuality, abuse, death, friendship, love, even existence. There are issues that don't only occur, these are issues that don't only occur in young adults, which makes the book great for either teen or adult. There is something in it for everybody, presented in a way that is not overbearing, but also presented in a way that is meant to break through walls, that is meant to make you stop and think as a reader. The final letter, which is on the very last page of the book, um, gives a ray of hope for readers, for those who have bonded with Charlie and for those who are struggling themselves. Please believe that things are good with me, and even when they're not, they will be soon enough, and I will always believe the same about you. So why I chose this book is pretty much for the fact that this is the book that got me. This is the book that I was hooked to immediately and couldn't be drawn away. I read it several times, probably about seven different times. It's a problem. And I also got a tattoo about it here, which says infinite which um, when you read it you'll understand what that means because that's how Charlie feels um, at one very like happy moment in the book. And there are a lot of dark themes in the book, I'm not going to shy away from that, but there's also a hopeful aspect of it and a sort of light that can get you through anything that kind of happens and that's why I keep returning to this book and that's why I always recommend this book to people because it can get you out of some really like crazy stuff and like it, everybody needs to read at one point or another and that is my presentation okay, thank you very much all right open up to q a does anyone have a question what's the biggest theme that you take away from this book um probably self-discovery um, there's a lot of that that Charlie does, and I think it's very important for me. I read this when I was in high school, and then I read it again when I was um, in college. It just, I was two different people, and I think this helped me connect both of the identities and kind of grow from those experiences. Anyone else? Did you have a question before? I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. It does. Now, did you see the movie? And if so, did you think it did a, a good justification of the book? I did see the movie. I saw it the day that it was, came out. It was only in two cities, New York and LA being the two cities. And it was only in one theater in New York, which is really annoying. Um, but I thought that they did a great job because the author actually screenwrote the play. So it wasn't a director taking the, the book and making its own thing. It was the author who actually wrote it, who actually chose the people. And I couldn't have like pictured a more fabulous cast for this movie, or even the screenwriting. So I'm very happy with the movie, which is rare. Yeah, it's very rare. Does anyone else have another question? No? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have our final battler. Justine will be reviewing The Knife of Letting Go by Patrick Ness. The Knife of Letting Go. Of, oh, it's, it just says letting go here. Of never letting go. Wow. Okay. My apologies. <laughs> All right, this is the book that I'm reviewing today. It's The Knife of Never Letting Go by Patrick Ness. It's the first of a trilogy called Chaos Walking. Um, I'm gonna start with a quote. But a knife ain't just a thing, is it? It's a choice. It's something you do. A knife says yes or no, cut or not, die or don't. A knife takes a decision out of your hand and puts it in the world and it never goes back again. The Knife of Never Letting Go is about a boy named Todd. And he's the youngest, he's the last remaining child in a town called Prentice Town. 
And it's a strange place because everyone can hear everyone else's thoughts and it's an overwhelming stream of noise. So it's like all of your thoughts are projected outward into the world at all times in this like noise cloud. Um, and um, it's caused by a germ and that infected all of the town and killed the females and infected the males. So there are only males left in this world and they all can hear each other. Um, as Todd approaches the rite of passage the town uses to make boys into men, he discovers that the town has a secret and he's forced to run away for his own protection. As Todd runs, he stumbles upon a mysterious girl named Viola. Um, unaffected by the germ that caused the noise, Viola is a silent space within the blanket of sound Todd has lived with all his life. And at first they struggle to trust each other and to, to work together and get to know each other, but um, soon realize they're pursued by the same enemies. Um, armed with only his dog, a hunting knife, a book his mother left him that he can't read, and Viola, Todd must find a way to escape the mayor of Prentice Town and his men, even when everyone who is chasing him can hear his noise from a mile away. Um, so there's a lot of really unique things about this book. For starters, um, Todd's an unreliable narrator. He's uneducated. He knows nothing about the world he's coming from. And so he makes a lot of presumptions, and they're often incorrect. Um, he's also angry um, because all of the men in this town have been projecting their thoughts and they're upset about having to hear everybody else and, and it echoes through the town and so he's been raised in this environment where there's a lot of anger so he comes off as very angry. Um, the author uses Todd's vernacular so often the, the writing is very like 13 year old southern boy kind of writing and a lot of slang. Um, and. He, um, he's not only angry, he's trying to pretend to be grown up. Um, so he's, he's this 13 year old who thinks he's old, he should be older than he is. And so he says things like this, like he, he doesn't just have anger from his emotions, he also has embarrassment. So there are lines like this. I think, and I'm so hacked off, still raging with anger and hate and fear. Yes, fear, shut up. And I don't even look around to see Aaron, see if Aaron heard my noise. And so, Throughout the novel, he kind of goes from likable to unlikable and back because of the fact that he's such, so unpredictable and unreliable that when you start figuring things out, he, he can sometimes be almost a little bit harsh. Um, there's also Manchi the dog, and Manchi the dog can also be heard. Um, so his thoughts are out in the air, and in that ador adorable dog way where he's very loyal and simple, and also often asks Todd if he can go poo. Um, so he's also sort of, he's sort of the light of the story. The light of the story can get really dark, um, but Manchi is usually a point of laughs. Um, and um, there's also this really cool fact that the noise can be seen, and I'm gonna look, um, they, he doesn't just explain the noise, he shows you the noise. <laughs> um, so that's what Todd's living in, with his, his head all the time. Um, so that's a pretty cool point. The uh, narrator has, um, let's see, I'm sorry. So that noise, a quote about that noise, the noise is a man unfiltered, and without a filter, a man is just chaos walking. So this is not a um, story that talks down to you as a young reader. Um, it's got these major societal issues in included, um, society versus individuality, because Todd's trying to find himself, racism and misogyny, um, racism about the aliens, misogyny about dealing with um, this new woman in his life and, ha and how she showed up and what she means and how to deal with the fact that she's so different from him. And um, corruption and leadership because the mayor is as corrupt as they come. Um, and um, most of all, it's about a uh, journey, uh, both outward and inward towards the choices, the actions, and the emotions that make us an adult. So I'm gonna leave you with one last quote. The knife is alive and as long as I hold it, as long as I use it, the knife lives. Lives in order to take life, but it has to be commanded. It has to have me to tell it to kill. And I want and it wants to. Um, but I have to want it as well. My will is to join with its will. Ah, almost done. <laughs> almost. Almost. <laughs> so time for Q and A. Who has a question? I may have left that out in the part of my presentation. This uh, Prentice Town actually is um, called, in a place called New World. Uh, they are, though you don't see it right away, it takes a while for that to unfold. 
there are there are settlers on another planet. It's not it's not an active part right away, except for when you start me discovering, unraveling things about the world, and you learn that there are these people called the Spackle, and the Spackle are um, were were aliens that they stumbled upon and pretty much destroyed when they got there. Um, just fear of of an innocent group that they didn't you know they didn't understand, so they assumed it was evil. Any other questions? Um, what's the biggest theme of the book that you think it tackles? Um, really, I, I think um, I think the misogyny in this book. I mean, there's there are, there are three books and it goes over a whole range. But in this book, I feel like the the, the balance between Todd and Viola and having someone who he inherently doesn't trust because he can't hear her thoughts and everybody he knows has has been projecting their thoughts out into the world. So um, for him, she's she's this oddball character and, and I feel like they, they grade against each other and there's also the fact that there are no women around and that instantly creates this difference and this distrust between them um, that can be reflective of male-female relations in regular life. So, okay. well, Todd is about 13, and he's the last remaining child. So, um, shortly after his birth, um, yeah, it, it's relatively recent. Any other questions? What part of the book were you most drawn to? Like, like any moment, any characters, any like aspects? Yeah. Um. Initially, I was drawn to, I thought it was just a cool book. Like, I was like, oh, how cool. You can hear each other's thoughts, and what does that, that cause? Um, and wanted to just kind of see what kind of crazy chaos that would ensue. But, um, but as you grow, to, uh, Todd is really the draw. Todd uh, is such a complex character, and he's, he's very emotional, and you just feel for him. Uh, as he goes through this journey and discovers that pretty much everything he knows is untrue, um, you you understand what it's like to, to grow up through him. Okay. Okay. Very good, battlers. Give yourselves a, a louder applause than that. Yes, it's amazing. Good job. All right. So now comes the moment of truth. Oh, there's a separate system. Hold on. Okay, you are all going to get ballots. So, anonymous ballots. Yeah, sure. We're all waiting. Um, this is Ashwood. This is my book. Um, it is a YA horror story. It uh, is about a girl named Willow. She's 16 years old. She goes urban exploring in an abandoned asylum, and when she leaves, the entities follow her, let's just say, in her nightmares, and slowly it bleeds over into real life. Um, it's heavily inspired by both Jungian psychology and Slavic folklore. Um, I really wanted to get into the idea of what fear is, both from a cultural and a folklore point of view, and also from a scientific and uh, like psychological point of view and how they kind of go together um, or don't in some cases. So uh, if you are interested in checking it out, it is here as well and I will be happy to sign it for you. And I uh, will be having a sequel coming out to it called The Spoiling, which should be out hopefully next winter. Justine's looking at me like soon. <laughs> I'm working on it. I read it, guys. If you if you like horror, it is it is a bit cerebral. I'll be, I'll be honest, but uh, if you like that sort of thing, please check it out. Um, in addition to all the other amazing books that are here, so question: Did you guys have a good time? Was this fun? Yes. Awesome. This is great to hear because we would love to be having more events like this in the future. Do we have the results? Oh, drum roll! Winner. And. The winner. Please explain what it is, too. Again. Okay. This is after the presentations. It's not on the presentations, but that's on the one that the audience wants most to read. Right? Yes, this is. So the audience, after all these presentations that were done today, out of our five, this book is the one that people want, are the most interested in reading. And that is 
Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe. Very good job, Nada. Very, very good job. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> We will be having more events, or at least we'd like to have more events like this in the future, so please, um, if you have any other like bookworm friends, you know, people who really enjoy uh, reading, learning about new books, this is a great way for you to be able to learn about new books, and we'll have different um, themes coming up as well, so please, you know, uh, get the word out, and please come back. We do post on uh, the Kino Kuniya website as well, our upcoming events, and we always have some great and fun um, events coming up all the time. So thank you all for coming out, those who battled and those who helped crown our winner. Good job, guys. <laughs>